Hello, and thank you for joining me, Laurel Beachy, in honoring the 150th anniversary of Tilsonburg's incorporation as a town way back in 1872. I'll tell you a tale about the Grand Lady of Tilsonburg, our town hall, that nobody even wanted to build. For over 20 years, our council had no home. They would be just fine, however, renting the Sons of Temperance Hall on the southeast corner of Baldwin and Bidwell, which was also known as the Music Hall, and churches and groups used it. What else did the council need but a place to have a meeting? They voted. The answer was no. But they would need storage for records and supplies, paperwork. They needed desks, office chairs, and equipment. Maybe they got the second floor of the hall. Well, whatever they did, it worked. It wasn't until 22 years later in 1894 it came up again that we need a town hall. The debate began for and against. Like other towns and city, it would provide a central biz building easily recognizable for municipal affairs. It would be a symbol for our town. The visitors could find information easily, a place for civil and cultural activities, a place to gather in a town emergency. It would be the heart of our town. But it would raise taxes. So they voted again. No. Hmm. Now, only two years later, in 1896, the town was forced by the threat of rising insurance costs to update their firefighting equipment. That it was then that they decided that the municipal services and offices, fire hall, police station, market, and public auditorium could be combined under one roof. The vote was won by a small margin. Okay. So where would they build their first town hall? Right where I think the founder George Tilson planned it to be. This map is from 1865, showing the majestic Washington Grand Avenue in gray highlight that led up to the whole market square in green. This is a later map showing where the town hall was built. And here is what the market square looked like with the Matheson House on the right. It was later burnt and rebuilt and known as the Arlington Hotel. Who would be the architect? Well, Elmer-born Mark Lightheart Duffy won the job and the Tilsonburg Town Hall turned out to be one of his most striking works. The plans were hung in a window on Broadway for public inspection in May 1896. In only November of that year, slowly but majestically from the dirt of the Market Square, the proposed $8,000 edifice rose. People stopped to watch its construction. They still argued as to its necessity. While contractors Mr. John Smith and Mr. McClure, and at times, sometimes up to 15 men worked on this building. There were delays for changes, mistakes, and alterations for fire safety, etc. Very exciting was Mr. Berkeley's electric company who proposed to have electric lighting in it. There would be two furnaces, an opera house with seven stage drops, and much more. <coughs> Excuse me. Look carefully at this photo, for there are two men up a ladder at the top of the tower. There's also a ladder to the roof as well. Think about construction without all our machines and computers. This is a superb photo to show the detail in the brick. The buttresses, decorative and functional, with pointed iron pinnacles on the top. Now, March 10, 1898, only a year and two months later, the division court was held in their new quarters and a special meeting of the town council held in the council chambers. The Woodstock Sentinel Review toured in Mar on March the 11th and reported, quote, the good people of Tilsonburg are in a sore perplexity. They employed an artist to paint the town's crest on the stage of the new town hall and the result of the gentleman's effort is the cause of the trouble. The liberal newspaper says it's intended for a beaver, but that full justice has not been done on the remarkable animal. The observer, on the other hand, describes it as an otter surrounded by maple leaves. Perhaps as the artist is an American, and the designs he attempted to execute was maybe that of a possum. It might well 
might be well to have the painter's certificate as to the animal's identity. And that crest is today's crest, so it really does look like an otter. The Tilsenberg Observer on Friday, April 1st, will give us a tour of what Tilsenberger saw as they went to the opening performance in the Opera Hall. I will interject occasionally when you need a little more information. They saw an imposing red structure adorned with decorative brick, stone, and ironwork, graced by a regal bell tower from which the Union Jack flew proudly. It was set back off the street, and as one walked down the long sidewalk enhanced by the green lawn on either side, one realized that the town hall added greatly to Tilsenberg's dignity. Here was a place to meet, celebrate, and to demonstrate. These were the proposed floor plans, which of course were altered, altered in many ways before that building was done. But you will, you should notice the differences when I read them out. The red brick edifice was 45 feet by 85 feet, faces Broadway from a position on the market square, the rear wall being a short distance from Harvey Street. Its three stories are topped with a tower over the center of the front end, while a hose tower rises from the southeast corner at the back. A wide door at the front corner of the North Hall admits one to a roomy basement floored with cement, which apartment is to be used for market purposes. A stairway from this door also leads to the first floor of the building. This is me. This is not the right time period, as you can tell by the ivy all over the building, but it shows the grand entrance details. The stained glass on it notes, erected A.D. 1897. So now we'll go back to the tour. Let us go up from the broad main stairs of the main entrance and passing through the big front doors. Here, the council chamber, clerk's room, committee rooms, etc. are on the first floor and are reached by stepping along a short corridor leading from the main entrance. The council room is very large and well lighted. The entrance to the fire hall is at the rear and here the hose tower and wagons find convenient space. The rooms upstairs for the firemen's use are not yet furnished, but soon will be. I'm interjecting again here, because in these plans, the stage on the second floor was to be situated over that fire hall, but had to be moved forward due to insurance situations to the opposite end of the building. Eventually, fire hall apartments were built back near the rear of that area. In February, the council had decided a three-inch brass pole would be purchased for the fire hall at the cost of not exceeding $20, so the square hall had to be enlarged and rounded. Back on the tour, we're going to the vestibule. Here on either side of the hall are wide staircases leading to a landing where the door admits the public into the auditorium of the entertainment hall which seats 650 people. Evidently though, the third floor is a secret. There are no plans right there. Now this picture is not our opera hall, but it was the closest I could find to the following description of ours. So please imagine the changes as you look at this example. The view that bursts upon the eye at the top of either flight of steps is a fine one. The many windows and very high ceiling from which hang clusters of electric lights add to the general air of expansiveness, which is further enhanced by the roomy stage and the raised terraces on the floor that give the occupants of all the opera chairs an equal advantageous view. The white walls and delicate neutral colors of the painted foliage on the presidium is relinked re 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 by the dash of crimson in the draperies painted on the drop curtain, the color of the seats which have been stained in cherry, and the ornamental railing of the gallery. The stage curtain is some three or four feet from the electric footlights, leaving ample space for the performances before the curtain between acts, and the space is gracefully arched, overarched by a concave ceiling adorned with ornamental traceries by the painter's brush. Crimson curtains hang from the sides towards the steps. Well, Council, Council ratified the contracts for opera chairs for that new hall. The Globe Country Company furnished the seats for the level part of the floor, the first two rows of the first rise, 
and the front gallery row for $1.15 a chair. But Mr. Weston and Carpenter provided the rest, the former seating the remainder of the hall for 43 cents a chair, and the latter, the rest of the gallery, at only 20 cents a chair. Seating costs were $600. The past and present have one thing in common, that building always costs more than is planned. The $8,000 allotted built the building, but another $2,500 was needed to heat, furnish, and outfit that building. Mr. John Weston supplied two Claire furnaces at $250, and they were in the basement. Those originally opposed to the project raised their voices once more, but the work had to go on. The decision was made to remove the proposed market shed, as it would mar the architectural lines of that building. Instead, the basement would be fixed up and the market held there. The bell was to be purchased for $500 and placed in the tower. How did they get that 1,300 pound bell up to that tower? Well, the Tilsonburg Observer on Friday, April 1st, will give us a tour of what Tilsonburg... Oh no, that's, excuse me, that's March 11th. The Grand Lady became the heart of Tilsonburg where people gathered. She looked good from all angles. She took Tilsonburgers through World War I, a pandemic, the need for a cenotaph, the Great Depression, World War II, and then the more affluent years. Entertainment, whether silent movies at the beginning or annual dance reviews in the 1950s, drew citizens to her over the decades. Yet, like all old buildings, the changing years changed the needs of a building. Additions were need, needed for more fire equipment. The market left the basement. The town grew. In the beginning, the police station and other prisoner cells were in the basement. The prisoners stayed, but the staff moved up into the council chamber and reading room, and the council moved up into the opera hall. Well, she's getting old. Things were not kept up or repaired well. Slowly her adornments were removed. The fancy stonework above the windows, the columns, no more supported their pointed tops and ornamental ironwork. In 1956, the bell tower was removed by a crane. The building now looks strange and stubby. If it had been alive, I'm sure it would have been ashamed. In August of 1964, plans were drawn to revamp the front entrance with the stairs on either side. Well, the Grand Lady was still gathering a gathering place, but it was very out of date. Too small, decrepit, and fading fat quickly. She did last another 15 years, but in July 1979 she was demolished. Everyone seemed upset, but new to town, I didn't understand. Her bricks were disintegrating, and it was ugly by the time I came. I had never actually, though, ever seen a picture of her glory days. From the beginning, when the Tilsons set, settled here, the town has always moved forward, which is also the town motto. So for the next, next few decades, we saw the town move away from our past. Our dignified old buildings from the past also became shabby and were demolished. Today. Our functional town hall is on the second floor of our downtown mall. The town bell was saved, though, and at some point was placed in front of the old museum on Lake Lister, as seen here with Bert Newman. And fortunately, someone saved the clock out of the old post office clock tower years before. Fifteen years after the old girl left, two, the two relics from the past were put together and when the Tilsonburg Rotary Club built a replica post office tower at Bridge Street and Broadway. The tower is surrounded by memorial paving stones engraved with the names of various prominent members of the community as well as those designated by donors. It was set 20 years after incorporation to build the town hall and it immediately seemed to fill a void that many people had not even realized existed. It was if the Grand old building had become the heart of town. Somehow the town center mall just doesn't quite capture the spirit or the heart of the town hall. 
Oh, that we could have an exterior replica of our old, unique, dignified, grand old lady once again to be the focal part of our town. But, but, that would raise the taxes. But thank you for watching today. If you would like to help save the history of the town hall, there are still so many questions to be, to be that still remain to be answered. Like, what was on the third floor? What did the opera hall and original council chambers actually look like? If anyone has photos of the interior or exterior or stories or descriptions of our town hall, if you would share them, please give me a call or email. And just so you know, any information given to me is also goes to the museum, so it will be around forever. Their exhibit right now at the museum is on the whole 150th anniversary of incorporation of the town and features a little segment on the building itself. So you don't want to miss it. It's very interesting and many old artifacts have been pulled out of storage. A special thanks goes to Annandale National Historic Site, Patty, Patricia DeLebeck, and Joanne Tully-Passmore. And you, of course, for loving history. Thank you.